I will be reading from Jesus, the Eternal Bridegroom, The Forbidden Abyss, Part 2. I'm the author, Gabriel Chana. This is taken from the chapter, San Francisco Jesuit Homosexual Compound. They walked by Terrance in a procession, one by one, slapping him in the face. You're not fit to have the torture we've given to your friends, because you've never had brain-to-brain -brain sex with Gail. They pulled down their pants and flung their penises at him. She won't ever make love to you because you're black. It reminded me of Jesus when he faced his accusers before they humiliated him on the cross. How they all went up to him and bashed his face in with their fists. Ah, Lord, the disciple is not above his master. Then they ripped off his clothes and forced him to carry his own cross, exposed, nude and humiliated before the world. How Satan loved to torture Jesus. How he writhed with jealousy that he could never be as awesome as God's son. How the inferior ones punished those superior to them. How horrible that you couldn't get them to leave you alone unless you executed them. Because they refused to give up their evil, their murders, and their tortures any other way. It amazed me how my mind wandered off with thoughts of Jesus in the midst of this horror. Perhaps thinking of him and how he endured it gave me some steel, some belief that all this had a purpose. But the love I had for Gail was so awesome that it attracted the notice of Satan and his cohorts, who obsessed over defeating that awesome love, to prove that such things are fairy tales, and therefore those who follow Satan should not be punished for evil, because they can eradicate the good and replace it with evil thus trying to make evil appear good and omnipotent. You see, God, the goodness you expect of the human race is impossible. We are proof of that by our very existence and that you allow us to get away with our crimes. Will you punish those who have cooperated with us in our crimes like you do us? Well, you should. If not, you are unjust, and we are right to oppose you to the Jesuits. God was an unfair and unreasonable douchebag to expect everyone to be perfect like him. To make themselves worthy, they had to destroy what was worthy. Then Satan and his Jesuits went before God and said, See, we deserve heaven because no one on earth is more worthy than us. We have defeated true love, which is some fairy tale you've concocted, some idealistic dream, totally unattainable. Nobody wants to be perfect and boring like you, Jesus. You must accept us as we are and not demand perfection for entrance into heaven. Unfair, unjust. If you are so great, why won't you protect those who try to be perfect like you? Can't you stop us? Why are you so evil that you allow the humans who try to do it your way to suffer such humiliation? The mere fact that we can get away with all this means we are stronger and better than your weak followers. And we have the right to exist as we are. And so Satan and his followers sneered at me and Gail and the men who loved her stating we are so weak and pathetic, or else we would not submit to Jesuit sex. You see how they all stick their penises in us? <laughs> we are so superior that your followers cannot resist us. We will reign. You, Jesus, are not strong enough to protect your weak followers from us. I thought of one of Gail's favorite novels, The Thornbirds. The best is only bought at the cost of great pain. Kind of ironic that it was about a Catholic priest. Then they hoisted onto Terrance and thrust their penises into his mouth. I winced. It was like I was replaying September 1992 with Lori McBride. She had expanded her torture to all my friends. I could feel that warm blast in his mouth as if it was my mouth. Making love to Lori was like making love to Satan who shoved his tiny eels like snakes into the head of my penis to pollute my sanctuaries and shatter my innocence. The vile imaginations of these criminals shocked me into numbness. With each intrusion into my sanctuaries, the places where I only dreamed of Gail, I felt my heart shut down. I lost all feeling and went numb. It was the only way I could stand it. 
my heart refused to feel. I became ice, horrified, out of my senses. When you get a mortal wound, they say you know it, because all sensation leaves and you feel numb, because all the blood is drained, and there is nothing alive left to feel. That's how I felt in every way, physically, mentally, and emotionally. I felt my mortality had ended, and that I would meet God in another life. I mean, meet Gail in another life if I met her at all. This feeling of being in another world, of denying my present reality to bear the unbearable, had become my way of life, an entrenched habit, so that I went into autopilot, and my heart shut down, and I lost all feeling. Lastly, my brain shut down, so that all around seemed a dream. Please let it be a dream and let me wake up. My life became surreal. Images of horror terrorized my imagination. I felt dizzy and nauseated with disgust. Oh, Jesus, help me. Help us all. Is this what we must endure because we love the forbidden Gale? Why is she forbidden? Why must we suffer for loving greatness? Oh, Jesus, are you there? After stripping Gerard Butler, they stared at him and pointed, giggling, and hee-haw. Ah, what a fine specimen. What fun. They pulled a dress over his head and arms, dressing him like a little girl. Oh, that's cute, they said, limping their hands at him. With smiles so wide, you could almost see all their teeth. The Jesuit pride opened Gerard's mouth and shoved a penis in. Our wonderful psychiatrist would need some intervention after this. How I felt for Gerard, so selfless. He always thought of us. Who would counsel him when all this was over? Come on, little girl. Suck hard on your mama's nipple. Just then another Jesuit shoved his penis into Gerard's anus, both the Jesuit in his mouth, and the one from behind coordinated their thrusting motions like in a dance. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief. Tell me this is a dream, Jesus. Tell me we aren't doing this. But the penis was in my mouth, thrusting like a wild Indian and the salty taste of semen would not let me deny the reality of my existence. When they came to Hugh Jackman, he raised his fists and shot the fist into the Jesuits who approached him. The Jesuits flew back onto the wall. About ten Jesuits then flew themselves onto Hugh and held him down. A black Jesuit with elephant legs and blubber protruding from his belly and bulges of fat on his back shoved his rear onto Hugh's face. Bubba! they said to the black Jesuit, teach him for beating us up. The black Jesuit named Bubba shoved his anus onto Hugh's mouth. Lick my butthole, he laughed. Ten Jesuits pinned Hugh to the floor, freezing his arms and legs. They hoisted his face onto the two balls of fat above Bubba, Bubba's legs, his rump, and shoved Hugh's face between the balls. Now lick the butthole like a good boy. They twisted his arm, and he grimaced in pain. His tongue came out, and they separated the balls of fat, exposing the zinnia-flowered hole, <clears throat> his tongue traveling <clears throat> over its surface. Then we heard an explosion, and brown feces, ex feces exploded onto Hugh's face and into his mouth. I could see a scowl on Hugh's face, but the Jesuits held him firm in his place, his arms and legs frozen. The Jesuits filmed us the entire time with cameras and movie equipment. It reminded me of my time at the San Francisco Zoo when Lori raped me, raped me with elephants, eels, and God knows what else in September 1992. So you, you see people, <clears throat> this is from my book. <clears throat> Boy, if I had a time making this video. Jesus, the Eternal Bridegroom. I'm reading you from it. This book goes really deep into the hearts and souls of Jesus Christ, 21st century disciples, which are me and my men.